Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence. How you doing? A big mahalo for uh, catching this. I am uh, in Kahala at the Kahala Hotel, and I'm with a buddy of mine who, over the last several years, I've grown to have him be a, a good friend. He's a very talented drummer. We're going to hear some of his amazing stories today. Currently in the band Chicago, but his stories go way beyond that. It's Tristan Bowden. Aloha and mahalo, my brother. <laughs> Aloha, Dave. It's great to be here great to have you here and uh and you've got the the long connection to the islands too right i mean your first wait does it what being here does it bring back memories of coming with honk or what comes to mind absolutely all the way back to the early 70s with honk and uh we played at andrew's amphitheater uh at the uh university and god that was i mean it was like a dream come true really because ever since I, I i was a boy i'd always wanted to come to hawaii so, and I've been coming, i living here too at a certain point in my life. And then, of course, building relationships as a musician, playing with Kalapana, playing with CNK, Amy Hanayali'i. Yeah, yeah, no, all those people have, and I've, I've loved the local music scene so much, and uh, always have, and, and uh, I'd like to become involved again, but I, I've got to move back to do that, you know. Who was the first local musician you worked with? Well, I actually probably. Uh, well, Kalapana, I, I worked with, uh, I think, first. Uh, maybe it was Henry. It could have been Henry, Henry Capono. I did some live shows here uh, with him uh, in the 80s. After having recorded, yeah, that was it. We did uh, um, Good Times Together, that, that album, and that song. Still, I hear to this day here on the on the island. Huge hit, huge. I mean, you got it. You're like part of the very fabric of of island musical culture. Oh, bro, thank you, thank you, man. Well, I love Henry so much, and he's just such a fantastic musician and artist as well as human being. I mean, I just can't say enough about him. And Cecilio as well, you know. But then Calapana were friends from the honk days, as well as as C and K. You know, we used to do shows together at the Troubadour. You know, back in the 70s, you know, when Honk was coming up. So so Honk had this record, and it was featured in a surf film. Is that That's what really opened the door to Hawaii, and that thing just naturally caught on here? Absolutely, yeah. It was a, it was a surf movie called Five Summer Stories, which, at, to that date, it was like the biggest box office gross of, of a, a 16 millimeter film of any kind. Uh, of any sort and so I mean all over the world it actually was shown and uh, Pipeline Sequence this song that we wrote actually for Lopez sing like surfing at, at Pipe uh, that was number one in Hawaii for a long time and so that's what started the whole the whole thing your relationship with, with, with the islands what got you into the drums to begin with oh man well actually that that's sort of island born as well I mean this it sounds kind of corny but but uh, my uh, my uncle actually crewed on a boat and uh, the Transpac, you know, from Los Angeles to to Hawaii, and they won that race. I was just a kid, you know, just cakey. And and uh, then there's a race from Honolulu to Papaete, and he he was there. Uh, they didn't win that one, but he fell in love with this Tahitian woman, and man, he he was there for four years. Came back speaking Tahitian and and uh, and also French and playing Tahitian guitar, and he brought me a Toede. So I and all these records of Tahitian drumming. So I just fell in love with Tahitian music, and still to this day, when I solo, I hear like you know this Polynesian some of those those rhythms in in my playing. And I I got to study uh, with a master on Kauai, Manea, uh, and also uh, Caradine Colburn, uh, who were both great master like Tahitian drummers. So later on yeah. what a trip the musically the islands had this huge launching point for you with the honk and leading to the Kalapan and the cnk but way before that via your family and and the, the drumming itself yeah i was all of like maybe six you know yeah i was that young uh when he came back <laughs> so in addition to the at to the way that the tahitian drumming and that's a great story how how that impacted you because you're in contemporary world of rock and you've played with all these amazing people some of which we're going to hear about in a second who were some of your first bands or albums that maybe people listening could also relate to maybe they had some of those first ones too okay well uh after honk kind of broke up i actually moved to la and i started recording i i wanted to become kind of get my feet wet as a as a recording drummer, you know, like a recording musician, and and uh, you had it in your mind you wanted to be like a session musician, session guy, yeah. And uh, so anyway, because Honk was kind of respected by critics, 
uh, because we were all over the map, kind of, you know, as far as real eclectic musically. Uh, we got the attention of a lot of producers. And so I, back then you could kind of break in playing on, mu- on demos for different, you know, like, like publishing houses and that sort of thing. So I started doing a lot of that work. Producers heard me and said, who was that? And they start, started using me. So Ian Matthews, the British guy uh, from Fairport Convention, that was my first session as a session guy. You know, I did two albums with him. Then I got the gig with Loggins. And then once we had a few hits, then I got started getting calls from everybody gratefully. And I, through David Foster and a lot of people, Roger Daltrey, Neil Diamond, uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. You know, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of different people. And then in the jazz world, Stanley Clark and, you know, uh, gratefully, a lot, a lot of people in, in a lot of different musical genres. So, the the trip of having uh, the Loggins in Messina, which is, I mean, there's a state. As you listen to this cat talk, you can hear why he has a lot of connections to the islands because Loggins and Messina would be one of those groups, right? That I mean, in, back in that era, they were one of the most popular bands here. Absolutely. In fact, I love that album. Say, uh, is it Sailing Away? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, it was her second album, wasn't it, or, or third? No, the first one was was Kenny Loggins with Jim Messina sitting in, and then uh, Loggins and Messina. Before they even knew, they titled it. It was, it was going to be like a Kenny record with him sitting in, and then they realized, wow, this should be a bit together. Exactly. That was Clive Davis that did that, actually, because he was the one that had put Jim Messina and Kenny together. With uh, yeah, What a guy a career Clive's had, huh? Oh, my God. I mean, talk about, you know like shaping modern like musical taste and musical history i mean that guy has contributed more kind of like an amet erdogan kind of cat absolutely absolutely yeah on that scale yeah Ahmed erdogan you know otis redding used to call him omelet <laughs> true story yeah I re- <laughs> you met the cat i'm assuming well actually i never did get to meet Ahmet. I, unfortunately, but I, I have gotten to meet so many of my my heroes that were also producers or executives, you know, in the in the industry, you know, that uh, have done so much to to shape it, you know. You did Loggins and Messina gigs at the Blaze Cell Arena, I'm assuming. Well, actually, with Kenny Loggins, because I didn't play with uh, Loggins and Messina while I was Loggins and Messina, but Honk opened for them, like you know, which was kind of prophetic in a way. We also opened for Chicago. <laughs> What year? That was like 73, 74 or something? It was probably, yeah, right around then. Yeah, about 73. Yeah. Is, is there any memory from those cats now that you're in the van? Has that, did that ever come up when you joined the band? Like, you probably don't remember, but I opened for you. Yeah, yeah. Kenny remembered the shows and remembered the band, you know, because we were like real vocal heavy, you know, a lot of harmonies and stuff, you know. And, uh, and of course, Logs and Messina was all about that as well. And so, yeah, they, they liked the band, you know, so that, that was cool. And I was a big fan, you know, I was listening to Long as the Messina albums like crazy, you know. I mean, they were so well-crafted, and, uh, you know, and Messina's a great producer, incredible producers. They were like, right from the minute I got here, they were one of those legendary sort of local names. And, and a name that I couldn't appreciate as much because it was a little bit, it was a different scale, was Honk. And I'd hear about this band and stuff, so it's really been surreal uh, uh, getting to know you on that angle. Another angle, another band that are kind of big in the islands, have an obvious connection thematically, and they're on your resume. I couldn't figure out where you got to work with the Beach Boys. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> the Beach Boys, again, Honk opened for them. And actually, uh, uh, we were on the road with the Beach Boys for a while. And so I got to know Carl Wilson, rest his soul, pretty well. And uh, and actually, a, a lot of the guys, Brian at that point wasn't touring with them. Uh, but I knew Al and, and Mike Love and all, all of that. Uh, so as fate would have it, I didn't really record with the Beach Boys, but I did record with Brian Wilson. Yeah, I was going to say, I saw Brian on there, too. <laughs> yeah, so and what an honor, because, I mean, God, talk about a master songwriter and, you know, Im- impactful, you know, musician. My God, I mean, what he's done for for modern music is incredible so yeah, yeah he's a he is a, a, a serious cat and i feel blessed to have gotten to do a couple different interviews with him along the way you mentioned him uh but briefly stanley clark he fits in how oh okay well actually uh it i met stanley uh 
through Howard Hewitt, which is an R&B singer that I'd recorded with. Uh, actually had a number one uh, R&B song called I'm For Real. Uh, um, in 80, I want to say 86 or 87. Anyway, Stanley was a friend of, of Howard Hewitt's. Howard was this incredible uh, vocal uh, vocalist who actually was part of Shalimar. It was he and Jody Watley, you know. Yeah, and uh, so anyway, through Howard, he introduced me to Stanley. And, of course, I'd been a big Chick Corea fan forever. So it was like, you know, I, I was in the presence of, you know, one of my heroes again. And uh, anyway, he liked what he had heard me do so much on Howard's album. As a matter of fact, he was co- he was producing the tracks. And so he asked me what I, what I was doing on Sunday, and I said nothing. He said, how'd you like to play on my record? And I went, are you kidding? God, of course. I mean, you know, I get my left, you, you know what? So. <laughs> That's so, so just one time you got to do a session with him. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. But uh, anyway, I've been so lucky because, I've, I've, you know, God, I've worked with David Sanborn and, you know, and, and Bob James in the jazz world and, you know, so many people, you know, that uh, and Al Jarreau I, I spoke of, you know. All people that I love so much, man. And uh, well, it lends a lot to what you have to do with Chicago when you think about it, because it's a complicated kind of arrangement. It's a different sort of band. People could say, "Oh, they're an oldies actor." People could say it's classic rock, but not so much. Not when you have to deal with the horns. Not when you have to deal with the charts. Not when you really have to deal w- with the arrangements. And equally similar, you know, with his music having a, a, a complex undertone, and I'm wondering how you got into his life. Stevie Wonder, I see, too, included in the, the cavalcade of incredible names. Well, I tell you, I've Stevie and I, I mean, I can't even talk about my love of Stevie. It's It it runs so deep and is so deep and goes goes so far back. I actually opened for Stevie Wonder as a, when I was the lead singer in a band and playing drums when I was like I must have been about 15 years old, and uh, at that time he was still little Stevie Wonder, right? <laughs> what, where did you open for him? Uh, what, 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 what venue? Oh, it was a place called Marina Palace in Seal Beach, California. They were like Quonset huts, you know, and they'd have these dances, and they brought in, you know, Ike and Tina Turner and, you know, bands like that, you know. But, but uh, we had a pretty good little band, and so, you know, we got asked to open for Stevie, and... Uh, Oh my God! That night changed changed my life. I mean, I I actually knew that's what I had to do uh, that evening. Defining moment in your career. Absolutely, and I I don't want to like delve too in, in detail too much, but I, long story short, I was I was so encouraged that night that I uh, that's when I knew <laughs> that I was this is what I was supposed to be doing. So uh, further experiences with him that that ended up mattering. I, I rec- yeah, actually. Uh, uh, well, I auditioned to be his drummer at one point, and uh, I was so flattered to be chosen because uh, I'd been working with Shaka Khan and then Al Jarreau, and anyway, so I was in, and uh, uh, there was only a few of us who were invited to to audition. To audition. What year approximately? That was probably 88, yeah, and uh, anyway, there was only a few of us. Uh, the thing about it was, was that it was... Uh, to make a long story short, it was logistically impossible to learn because he, he does like, like he chooses night to night from a, a catalog of 200 songs. And so to, this was two weeks before he was going to go on the road. So to, for any, any of us that had auditioned to learn 200 songs, even though all of us probably know those songs, you know, because we are all Stevie <laughs> Wonder freaks, you know, <laughs> was just logistically impossible. So, so no set. Yeah. So no, uh, uh-uh. so yeah, so it was, and and all of us played different tunes, and and God, it was so great. I got to play a song while he wrote it. He said, "Tris, give me a reggae beat." So I did, and he started writing a song. I was, I can't believe this, man. I get goosebumps now. <laughs> That, that's so reminiscent of him doing that with Jeff Beck when he was like, Jeff, do a beat, and he wrote uh, Superstition. <laughs> right, exactly, man, exactly. I'm getting the chicken skin just yeah. saying that, dude. That's sick. So you did a similar kind of move with the cat. Yeah, yeah. And I never did get to hear what he did with that tune, but I, I remember that moment, you know. It was so heavy. And then I also got to, uh, I had the honor of recording uh, with a thing that David Foster produced for Julio Iglesias was a duet with Stevie Wonder 
and so it was called My Love. It was a big tune for uh, Julio Iglesias. And I got to do what I always wanted to do. I asked Humberto Gatica, the, the engineer, look it, when we get done, can you just solo Stevie's vocal <laughs> just so I can hear it just alone in my headset, you know? And so he did. And I, oh, God, chicken skin again, you know? And you're like, I'm on that jam with him. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I couldn't believe it, man. I was like... Yeah, <laughs> that's a good moment. I'm I'm living it with you too. And another cat, I just want to get a, a, some some basis. We mentioned him too, uh, or you did it in the list of some some folks that you worked with. Neil Diamond. How did, how did Neil come into your life? What a what a figure. And are there any stories that that resonate around him? Well, actually, again, it was David Foster producing Neil Diamond. And the first time I worked with Neil, Neil wasn't anywhere to be found. He wasn't he wasn't around. You know, it was just me and and David and Humberto. And I just did drum overdubs on a on a song, you know. But the next time, you know, I was asked to play live with Neil Diamond, record a track live with the Jerry Hay horn section. I mean, it was part of Neil Diamond's live band. And then all these monsters, Steve Lukather and Landau, you know, and Nathan East. No, no, no. It was, it was uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember Neil's bass player at that time. It was Neil's bass player. And we cut it live without a click, the whole thing. And uh, yeah, it was uh, the best year. Uh, was it called the best years of my life? Yeah, I think that was the name of the song. And they ended up titling the album after that. I think you know. So that was that was heavy. And getting to talk to Neil, I was like, God, as he's walking up, and this can't be happening. You know. You know, I remember being like. 10 years old and listening to this guy and just going Kentucky woman or something exactly <laughs> all of that stuff man absolutely right. yeah so uh, anyway he was the nicest guy too he was just so humble and down to earth and that and uh, and then there was another time we were on the road and staying in the same hotel in Jones Beach New York and uh, same hotel as, as different uh, bands you weren't working I was, it was Chicago and uh, I'm sorry I should, should have clarified but Chicago and Neil Diamond and uh, Jason Sheff whom is the bass player and, and uh, lead singer with Chicago his father is Jerry Sheff who was Elvis Presley's bass player uh, anyway Ron Tutt was also Elvis's drummer who is now and has been Neil Diamond's drummer. So we got to hang out because Neil like rents out two complete floors, then has a, a, a hospitality suite that is catered. Like, you know, they roll in breakfast in the morning and everything. So we'd stayed up all night long just talking, just talking story, you know. And, and uh, man... Waiting for breakfast. Uh, breakfast. <laughs> man, so it was so cool. And then Neil Diamond walks in again that morning, and he just sits down and has breakfast with us like he's just, you know, one of the guys, you know. And he was just the nicest cat, man, just so humble and mellow, you know. When you talk about that good vibe, it's a great way to sort of wrap it with you because I think of this career we've only heard highlights of, but, but some of the highlights of. 23 years it's been... When you think of all those interesting gigs, it, once 90 hit in your life, the pace of things changed dramatically. You hooked with Chicago, and for whatever reason, and I guess that's the question, what was it that made this gig click into this multiple-decade run that you've been enjoying? Oh, man. Well, I think it's all about, like, great songs and great material, you know, first of all. Um, without an audience, you know, of course, Chicago couldn't have gone on for these past like 46 years now next month and uh so there's that coupled with the fact that that gratefully i have kind of that eclectic background from playing with so many uh, like we were saying it lends itself exactly because you know chicago's music is very challenging deceptively so to some people but uh, when you listen to the early stuff particularly like ballet for a girl from buchanan that that uh, Jimmy Panko wrote when he was 18 years old. I mean, it goes through all these time changes, and I mean, it's like very progressive rock, and uh, and uh, it's. I mean, for all of us, even though we've played it thousands of times, <laughs> it's still if you space for one second, you're gone, man. The song has passed you, you know. So I mean, you have to. It keeps. You have to be in the moment. You have to be in the moment, absolutely. And so I like that. I love that. And gratefully, they like the, my interpretation. I have to say that Danny Serafin, the, uh, my predecessor, was an, is an amazing drummer. I was, not was, is an amazing drummer. He's playing playing his ass off again. <laughs> and play, he's got a band. And, uh, 
and I'm so honored to have been chosen, you know, to, to just be take his place. It was like there was no audition. There was nothing like that, you know. So, And it clicked, I mean, personality-wise, too. Right, that's what I was waiting for. That has to be another crucial ingredient. Absolutely, because it's like, you know, it's like riding in a submarine, you know, with, the, the, you know, for for you know months on end you know with the same guys so if you don't get along personally it's gonna it's gonna rub it's gonna be a tough mission <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly under, well under the ice cap say again under the polar cap right, right? right with a bunch of cats you don't get along with that that's a good analogy it's Tristan Bowden. He's had an amazing career. We've just touched on a little bit of it, but we're fortunate that during his three-night, uh, three-island tour with Chicago, he was willing to take a few minutes and do this. Was this okay to meet your high standards? Oh, are you kidding? I love this, man. Dave, it's always such a pleasure, man. I'm telling you, it's always such a pleasure to see you and uh, to do an interview with you. I mean, uh, they're such intelligent questions, and uh, truly, you are a music literate, and I love it. You're a really solid dude. I'm really lucky to Carmine a piece for hooking us up and, and bringing us together. And, and uh, just much love and aloha for you, my brother. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> Tristan Bowden, Chicago.